for NASA's James Webb Space Telescope has captured detailed observations of the rare Wolf Rayet star. It's located 15,000 light years away and it's currently experiencing a unique phase. It's shedding its outer layers and producing cosmic dust, which has intrigued astronomers. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, great to see you. So what sort of observations of this star, what can it tell us about cosmic dust? Yeah, so, so these stars are really massive stars. They sit anywhere between 8 and 20 times the mass of our sun, and they go through these final phases where as they've expanded into space, their kind of outer layers puff out or shed uh, almost like a cocoon, as you're kind of seeing here. Uh, and in this case, it's actually produced 10 suns worth of dust. Now, that's a lot. And in fact, eventually those ingredients will come back together to form new stars. And what's going to happen is stars like this, um, shortly after this phase, uh, the collapse uh, in the inside of the star occurs, meaning the inside of the star can no longer support itself. It comes down, collapses, and produces a shock wave that essentially ignites the star, and then ignites all of that dust around it. So this is what we call a supernova. And so these massive stars go through these dramatic final phases. And by seeing all of this dust around it, it really gives us an clue to has as that shock wave will travel through it in um, you know, in the not too distant future, not in our future, but uh, <laughs> down the road, uh, it will ignite it. And then eventually we can see the details of how these things eventually recombine to form the new stars that are then born from it. So it's a very short lived phase, but really critical in connecting how this star dies and then how the new stars from it are born. Well, I'll tell you what, that James Webb telescope, once again, working over right. time, getting us those good pictures that we want to see, uh, Brad. Now, let's move on because NASA's Magellan spacecraft has sent back data from Venus showing evidence of volcanic activity. Is this rare or does this happen on Venus? Yeah, so, so this Magellan data is actually quite a few years old and they were only going through the archival imaging from it. Now, we've seen Venus before, and we've seen that there are a lot of volcanoes on Venus, uh, and we see evidence that volcanic eruption has happened at some point in the past, that you see lava flows, you see the shaping of the Venetian surface as it was uh, due to this volcanic activity, but never have we really seen the activity in the present time. Uh, and so what this image did is they looked at images about nine months apart, and they were able to see that in one of the vents of these volcanoes, uh, mass mons, they were able to see that there was a, a hole that opened up in the vent, as you're kind of seeing the right of that figure, that you had the original vent and a new one that appeared. And what they've calculated is the black area that's been filled in is essentially the lava lake, as we see what happens here. New vent opens up, lava pours out, and then you get the lava lake that stays in that vent. And so this is quite exciting because we've always, again, thought that volcanic activity happened on Venus. We thought it was very active, but we've never seen it in our time, let alone with the data to show that it's happening right now. But this clearly shows that, yes, not only did it did, but supports that idea that volcanism, volcanic activity is quite common on Earth, Mars and Venus, and has shaped these planets to the things that we see them today. Yeah, there you go. Fascinating. Now, NASA has selected Axiom Space to develop the space suits, Brad. Now, this is for its Artemis Three mission, of course, the mission which will land astronauts on the lunar South Pole. Tell us about the suits themselves. How have they been designed? Yeah, so so these, these prototypes that have come out, as you said, by Axiom Space, are, they're designed for a few reasons. So eventually they will probably be white. So even though the prototype, as you're seeing here, is dark, they will most likely be white. But really, they're a lot thinner. They're a lot more form-fitting. And the idea here is they're actually easier to move. So one of the problems with the generations of the spacesuits for Apollo and the generations of spacesuits that have been used on the International Space Station is, believe it or not, they come in only three generic sizes, small, medium, <laughs> or large. Now, this actually creates problems. You're already working in an unnatural environment with unnatural movements. And so, in fact, we often see injuries resulting from the spacesuits themselves. In fact, a number of astronauts get uh, shoulder reconstruction surgeries because they tear their shoulders in the oh. testing of these suits in the underwater tanks uh, in Johnson. So they're trying to find suits that are uh, easier to move in, still in the idea of keeping you safe, obviously, on the moon, 
but can be more comfortable and allow you to do more science in the work that you need. So this is a big step forward in not just comfortability, but actually long-term safety, as these astronauts will have to wear them for a lot longer than the Apollo missions, where they're only there for a couple of hours, usually at a time. The Artemis astronauts will be there for days to sometimes weeks or months, meaning that you can't have these problems occurring that long. So how uh, heavy are spacesuits normally for, for them to be that uncomfortable and possibly cause you to have a, a shoulder reconstruction? Yeah, so, so they're, they're insanely heavy because you have your systems of oxygen, air, you have heating and cooling systems, you have your equipment as well, you then have your insulation. So they're these, just these giant, bulky, heavy things. Now, on the moon, the idea is, well, there's less gravity, so that weight feels less on you. But proportionately, your muscles have slightly changed, so you have to deal with it. When they put them on in the underwater tanks at Johnson, they literally are craned into it because it's so heavy and so bulky, they can't do it themselves. And in fact, one of the features of these new ones is they should actually be able to enter them themselves. Right now, you need a second person to help you get in the spacesuit. It's so big and bulky. Now they should actually be able to do it themselves Again, get, getting you not only independence, but allowing for more options what they can do on the surface. Well, hats off to the astronauts that do this. They go to space, they put their body on the line, and uh, good on them. Brad Tucker, That's good right. to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us.